All right, good morning. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Welcome to our uh, uh, every other week um, FAQ Friday. Uh, we used to do these, um, these sessions weekly, but we've moved them to every other week, um, really in order to kind of give better content. Um, we used to do weekly FAQ Fridays and uh, it was just sort of open discussion. Uh, we would answer any questions that came up and we would um, you know, help address any, any issues and any questions. Um, but we found that, you know, not a lot of attendees got a lot of, you know, uh, benefit from those sessions because, you know, questions were kind of all over the place and, you know, you may or may not get some useful information out of the session. So we decided to kind of restructure, um, and, uh, over the past month or so, we've been doing every other week and each, um, session is actually um, targeted at a specific a specific topic. Uh, we do an actual presentation. We give you some actual tangible, usable information that you can take home. And then we do still have FAQ, um, you know, questions and answers uh, at the end of each presentation. Uh, and, you know, generally speaking, we, you know, we prioritize questions that relate to the topic at hand, but um, we are always available to answer any questions that come up. So, um, you know, I'll present today Today, we're going to go over the PPP forgiveness process. I'll try to keep my presentation to about half an hour. Uh, and then at the end, we'll open it up for questions. And like I said, you know, anybody that has a question about PPP loans can come to the front of the line. But anybody else that has questions about other unrelated topics are welcome to ask them and we'll address them um, time permitting. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, you'll also notice Tasha Anderson, my business partner, is not here today. Uh, she is uh, out of the office today, so I'm stepping in and, and uh, flying solo. So you just have me today, but I think you'll get something out of this presentation. So stay tuned. Um, okay, so I'm presenting my screen here. Hopefully everyone can see it okay. Um, you know, I guess I should say if, if, if there are issues, tech issues, if you can't hear me okay, or if you're having trouble seeing or anything like that, just send me a message in the chat and I can troubleshoot here. Um, but uh, today the topic is PPP loan forgiveness. So if you have received a loan through the, the Paycheck Protection Program, either last year uh, for the first round or this year for the second round, um, this presentation applies to you. Um, so listen in. Um, we're going to go through a, a few things. I'm going to explain the terms of the loan, um, what qualifies as forgivable, what doesn't. And then I'm going to talk about the actual application process and what you need to do to actually ensure that you your loan is fully forgiven. The, the intent of this program was always to give money to small businesses and nonprofits. The intent was never to um, you know provide a, a, a loans. It was really to provide um, you know actual gifts or grants to nonprofits and small businesses. Um, so the goal today is for everyone to get on the same page about how to actually convert that loan into a grant free and clear so that you don't ever have to repay it. Um, and, you know, obviously, to the extent possible, we want to maximize that loan forgiveness. Um, we want to get the entire loan forgiven if we can. And if not, the largest piece of that loan is forgiven as possible so that we don't have to repay um, more than we have to. And uh, the good news is the vast majority of borrowers in the vast majority of situations will be able to obtain full forgiveness on their loan. Um, you know, there are rare exceptions to that. And we'll talk about that a little bit today. Um, but the good news is, in all likelihood, you will get full forgiveness on the loan if you follow the steps properly to obtain forgiveness. Okay, so let me talk through the forgiveness terms real quick. Um, so forgiveness is based on eligible expenses incurred during the covered period. Um, this is immediately following the date that the loan is dispersed. So the covered period um, is a question people always ask about. It's a little confusing because this has changed a little bit. When the uh, CARES Act first passed last year, um, the covered period was eight weeks. There was no, no um, argument, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It was, it was eight weeks no matter what. Um, Congress has since expanded that to a period between eight and 24 weeks. So you get to choose your covered period uh, for any length of time between eight or 24 weeks. Can't be less than eight weeks um, and it can't be more than 24 weeks. The covered period will start on the date that you receive the money. So the date that that loan got deposited into your bank account is the date that your covered period starts. The clock starts then 
And then how long the clock runs is completely up to you, as long as it's between eight weeks and 24 weeks. Um, most organizations will choose a 24 week period because it's to their advantage to do so. The longer period of time you have, the more time you have to put payroll costs, to, to count payroll costs towards your forgiveness. Obviously, the more eligible costs you incur, the more likely you will have in, uh, eligible costs that exceed your loan amount. And the goal is to have eligible costs that meet or exceed your loan amount so that you can be fully forgiven. The SBA will not forgive your loan for more than you're able to demonstrate in eligible costs. So in other words, if, if you had a loan for $100,000, you only came up with $80,000 in eligible costs towards your forgiveness amount. That means and during the covered period, I should say, that means you're only going to, your, max, your forgiveness is maxed out at $80,000, right? It's maxed at what you received or it's maxed at what you spent in eligible costs. Um, so obviously having a longer forgiveness period or covered period is going to maximize your chances of, of, of accumulating eligible costs that exceed your loan amount. Uh, so, but that's what a covered period means. That's how that works. Payroll costs must account for at least 60% of all eligible expenses. It's another item that sometimes trips people up. On the next slide, we're going to talk about what qualifies as a eligible expense. Again, an eligible expense is an expense that the SBA has deemed, you know, qualifying towards your forgiveness amount. And again, you've got to add up all your eligible costs together and hopefully uh, over that over that covered period, uh, and hopefully those costs incurred during that covered period exceed the loan amount that you originally received so that your forgiveness, you get full forgiveness. If, you're, if your eligible costs during that covered period are less than your loan amount, your, your loan forgiveness will be limited to those eligible costs. So the goal is to maximize eligible costs. On the next slide, we'll talk about what qualifies as an eligible cost, but that next slide is sort of predicated on the fact that only 60% or at least 60% of your eligible costs must be payroll related. So we'll talk about how rent, utilities, um, personal protective equipment, those sorts of costs can count as eligible towards your loan forgiveness. But if you put all those costs together and it turns out that payroll costs are only 50% of the total eligible costs that you're reporting, that means uh, you actually need to take out some of your non-payroll costs um, so that your payroll costs account for 60% of total reported eligible costs. So it's one of those weird caveats, but this is called the Paycheck Protection Program, right? The goal of the program was always to preserve payroll more than anything. So the government's not interested in, you know, using that loan for you to, to, to forgive, you know, mortgage interest or rent or utilities if you're not actually preserving payroll. So payroll has to account for 60% of eligible costs. Forgiveness may be limited to the applicant, uh, sorry, limited if the applicant reduces employment levels and or wages. So this is the most complicated piece of um, the PPP forgiveness process. It's gonna trip people up. Um, if you are in a situation where during the course of COVID, and we'll talk about the period of time, but generally speaking, if, if, if you look at your employment levels, meaning the number of hours and the number of employees, the number of hours your part-time employees worked and the number of full-time employees that were on your staff, if either of those numbers went down in 2020 compared to 2019, you may be on the hook for um, uh, a, a reduction in your forgiveness eligibility. Um, similarly, if you reduce wages, so if if anybody on your payroll in 2019 ended up making 25% less, 25% or more, less than 2020, that means, you know, basically you've reduced wages in 2020 by 25% uh, or more. If that, if that applies to you, again, you may be on the hook for a reduction in your eligible forgiveness amount. So uh, if that applies to you, um, we'll talk a little bit about what that means and how that complicates the application process all that stuff, it's still possible. If you did one of those two things, it's still possible that you will achieve full forgiveness on your loan. Um, but there's a lot of mathematical formulas that flow into that that will complicate the process. 
and reduce the likelihood of you getting full forgiveness. So um, be mindful of that. My final bullet point here is that borrowers must apply for forgiveness within 10 months after the last day of the covered period to avoid making principal and interest payments. So that last day of your covered period, let's just assume 24 weeks, that's 24 weeks after your uh, you, after you received the loan, then add 10 months to that, that's the date that you really need to have your uh, forgiveness application submitted by. That's not the deadline for submitting the forgiveness application. Uh, technically, you have until the loan expires two years later to, su to, um, to submit your forgiveness application. But for all intents and purposes, you will want to for submit that forgiveness application before your um, before your your ten month um, expiration, because if you wait until after that point, you're going to start having to make interest and principal payments on your loan. Um, obviously, you want to avoid doing that. You want to just get that cleaned, wiped clean, free and clear, forgiven, and you're not going to be able to do that as easily if you wait ten months after the the covered period ends. So that's sort of your deadline for applying for forgiveness. I should also note, forgiveness is administered. The forgiveness process is administered through your bank. So the bank that you use to receive the loan would be the same bank that will walk you through the approval process for forgiveness. Um, if you have questions about the forgiveness application process, your bank is a good resource. Um, they're going to help you through the, the details of the application process, what's required, what's not, the documents they want to see, the documents they don't want to see. I will say every bank will administer this process slightly differently, just how, just like how the SBA had their requirements for uh, obtaining the loan and the banks interpreted those requirements slightly differently. The process is very similar for, for forgiveness. Uh, so you'll have banks that interpret some of these requirements slightly differently. Um, go with what your bank says. Your bank is sort of the arbiter of whether you're going to get forgiveness or not. Um, the bank does most of the review. They'll pass that on to the SBA for final approval, but. Generally speaking, if you can get your bank on board, you're in good shape. So you want to make sure that you're following your bank's guidelines and consulting with your bank directly if anything that I include in these slides is contradictory to what your bank is saying. What I'm including on these slides is really the SBA's guidance, um, which again, may be interpreted slightly differently depending on the bank that you work with. Okay, next slide, we're going to talk about eligible expenses. So we already talked about the fact that Basically, the goal is to achieve uh, a total eligible expenses above your loan amount during the course of the covered period. And that's why we said that you know having a covered period of 24 weeks is generally to your advantage because that's going to extend the chances or extend the period of time over which you can begin accumulating those eligible expenses. The goal is to get as many eligible expenses as possible um, so that we can maximize our loan forgiveness. Our loan forgiveness is based on a few factors, but in its simplest um, iteration, it is limited by the amount of eligible costs that you accumulate during that covered period. So it's important that we understand what those eligible expenses are. Uh, so I'll go through them here. So payroll costs is number one. Um, that includes, and this is, this is important, so I'm gonna ex explain this carefully. Payroll clock costs include gross wages to the extent that they that they do not exceed $100,000 on an annualized basis. So if your payroll is, let's just simplify and say your payroll is, um, is on a monthly basis. So what you have to do is look at every single person's in, uh, uh, payroll expenses for the month and any single individual that, that's been paid more than $8,333 8 in a given month their wages are capped at $8,333 for that month. Meaning if someone is paid $10,000 in gross wages for a given month, we have to reduce what they were paid to 8333 um, in order to you know, include them in the PPP forgiveness calculation. The $8,333, that's not a magic number. That's just $100,000 divided by 12. So that's just taking $100,000 in salary dividing that out by your number of pay periods. And that's the cap um, on any individual's gross wages for purposes of um, applying for PPP forgiveness. So um, we're looking at annualized wages. We're not looking at totals. In other words, just because you know someone might make 
$120,000 a year, they get paid $10,000 a month um, over a 24 week period. You know, let's assume they, they made 60 grand. Well, great. Um, that's less than $100,000 over the covered period, but it's not less than $100,000 on an annualized basis. You've got to look at every single month, how much were they making um, if you were to annualize that number and you're capped at that. Um, so per month, basically, that's $8,333. Um, these payroll costs also include employer paid state and local taxes. So typically, we're talking about state unemployment tax, potentially some local taxes if those get thrown in. Um, we are not talking about FICA. We are not talking about um, uh, Medicare or Social Security. We are not talking about federal withholdings or state withholdings. Um, withholdings are taken, as the name implies, those are withheld from employee paychecks. They are not expenses to the employer. Um, so all we care about is employer expenses, employer payroll expenses at the state and the local level. The, the SBA is not interested in forgiving amounts that you paid to the IRS for payroll taxes, for FICA and Social Security. Even though that is an employer cost, uh, it's paid to the federal level and they don't wanna, they don't wanna you know, pay for that. So. I don't know why the rule was written that way, but the, that's the way it is. So you only look at state and local employer payroll taxes. Um, and then employer paid health and retirement benefits. So any health, dental, vision, retirement benefits, all of that qualifies. You've got to be careful, though, that you're only counting the employer portion of those health and retirement benefits. So if um, if if your organization contributes $200 per pay period, to a retirement plan for every employee, but the employees may elect to, to pay additional amounts from their own paycheck, you can only count the $200 per employee that the organization contributes. You cannot include um, the amount that the employee contributes because the amount the employee contributes is included in their gross wages. And that would be double counting. If we took deductions plus gross wages, we can't do that. We can only look at employer costs same idea for health insurance. If, if the organization covers 50% of all health insurance costs, um, the eligible costs that we can claim on our PPP application are limited to 50% of insurance premiums. Uh, we, can't, we can't take 100% because only 50% is actually paid by the uh, organization. The rest is paid by the employee. So that's payroll costs. And I spent a lot of time on that because that's the most important line item on this list. Like I said, payroll costs have to account for at least 60% of all costs included on this list. Ideally, for our purposes, we recommend to our clients, payroll costs should account for 100%. If we can get away with it, if we can demonstrate um, that, that we had more payroll costs than the actual loan amount during that covered period, we will only claim that. We won't even mess with the other items because frankly, uh, it's a lot of work to gather the documentation required for these other items. The bank is gonna ask for a lot of detail um, and it's it's a pain. We would rather, literally, we would rather just, just go in and, and run one payroll report that shows that we spent more than we received in our loan over that 24 week process and then not even mess with gathering documentation for the rest because we're only claiming payroll as our eligible expenses. We don't have to claim more than the loan amount. We just have to find enough costs from this list to get us to that loan amount and then we're good. Uh, so the goal is to maximize our payroll costs so that we don't mess with the rest of the stuff. Um, if you gather all of your payroll expenses together for that 24 week period or that eight week period or whatever you select uh, and you still have not achieved enough expenses to, to reach your initial loan amount. In other words, let's say you had a loan of $100,000, you only had payroll costs of $80,000 um, during that 24 week period. Uh, well, let's say you only had payroll costs of, of uh, $40,000 during the eight week period. Well, then you're gonna wanna take the 24 week period, right? To see if you can get up to, to, um, to your loan amount going to 24 weeks. Let's say we expand it to 24 weeks and you've only come up with $80,000 in payroll costs. You still have a $100,000 loan that you want forgiven. Well, now you have $20,000 of other expenses that you need to uh, come up with. 
Um, and that's where you start going down this list to come up with those other expenses. Once you get enough expenses accumulated to reach that $100,000 threshold, you're good. You don't need to keep looking for eligible costs, but you're, you're going to keep looking until you get to that point. And remember, if you have a $100,000 loan, you're, you have to come up with at least $60,000 in payroll costs um, because that 60% requirement, 60% of 100,000 is $60,000. Okay, so let's say you have $80,000 in payroll costs, you still have $20,000 worth of eligible costs you have to come up with. Now we're gonna go down the list. Rent or mortgage interest, that's usually pretty easy to come up with documentation. Typically all you have to do is find a copy of the lease agreement or your loan documents if you have a mortgage. Um, and then a confirmation of payment, uh, maybe copies of checks that you've written or screenshots from bank statements that show that you actually paid your rent or your mortgage interest. Uh, again, only rent and mortgage interest um, during that covered period qualify. So you can't take rent expense from a future period or a past period. You got to only look at rent payments during that 24 week period. But assuming you can come up with some, you can add that to your eligible costs. Next, you'll look at utilities. Um, so utilities could mean a lot of things. That's, you know, internet, phone, um, uh, electricity, gas, water, sewage, um, trash, all of those qualify. Um, as you might imagine, that's a lot of work to track down. You've got to cop get copies of bills for each of those utility payments, and you got to get payment confirmations. Uh, so you got to find screenshots of bank statements or copies of checks that prove that you received the bill, but you also paid the bill. Uh, just having a copy of your Ameren bill is not enough because the SBA wants to see that you literally paid that bill within that 24 week period. Property damage sustained during protests and disturbances in 2020. This was an addition that Congress added in one of their um, more recent uh, legislations. Um, uh, any, any protests or disturbances that happened in 2020, if, if your organization sustained property damage, you can count that towards your forgivable amount. My understanding is any insurance proceeds have to be taken out from that number. So if you had $10,000 in property damage and insurance covered 8,000 of it, you can only claim 2,000 for your eligible expenses on this list. I assume that's not going to um, be a factor for most organizations, but it's something that is available to you if, if that applies. Personal protective equipment, PPE, uh, or any modifications that are made to your facilities to meet health and safety requirements. So if you have to put, um, you know, uh, hand washing stations in your building, or you have to add um, uh, plexiglass throughout your building, or anything like that, those expenses can be included in your eligible expenses. Uh, and then finally, contractor payments relating to agreements and purchase orders that were in effect prior to taking out the loan. So this is kind of an interesting caveat. If you pay an independent contractor, let's say an attorney, a grant writer, uh, an accountant, somebody like that um, on a recurring basis, um, those costs can be included in eligible expenses only if your payments relate to a contract that was in place prior to the date you took out the loan. So if you have a an attorney on retainer and you pay him a flat fee each, each month and that contract is for 12 months and it was initiated in January of 2020, you can count his payments to the extent that they were made during the covered period towards your eligible expenses uh, because you were committed to making those payments back in January before you took out the loan. If on the other hand, uh, you um, take out the loan in April of 2020, and then in May, you realize, okay, because of this loan, we can afford to hire a grant writer um, to help us, you know, obtain some more grants and kind of bridge our funding gap this year. If you bring on a grant writer after um, you take out this loan, any, any costs that you pay to that grant writer cannot be accounted as eligible costs for purposes of PPP forgiveness. So important caveat to keep in mind. Again, it's kind of a lot of work to track down. You've got to track down the copy of those contracts to prove that they were in place before the date of the loan. You've got to get a copy of any invoices that your contractor sent you, and you've got to obtain payment confirmation um, to prove that you actually paid those contractors. It's a lot of documentation to gather. So if you can avoid including any of those eligible costs in your, in your list, great. Meaning if you're able to come up with enough eligible costs to exceed your loan amount from any of the other bullet points, 
do that. I would use your contractor payments as a last resort if you still can't come up with enough costs to get you to that loan amount. Um, okay, let me talk through the application process real quick and then we can go through questions. So there are actually three different forms that the SBA has put together for the forgiveness process. Now, one caveat to this is, like I said before, your bank ultimately has to submit one of these three forms to the SBA for processing. You may not be physically filling out that form. You may be filling out a form that the bank gives you, and then the bank is behind the scenes converting their form into one of these three forms. Um, so I'll show you a copy of these forms so you can see what they look like, uh, but you may actually never see those forms uh, in, in your application process. It depends on, on how your bank has set up the process. I've worked with many banks that, um, that show us the form straight from the SBA and they just say, hey, fill it out and then hand it to us and we'll review it and then we'll hand it to the SBA. Those are great because we know how to fill out those forms. We've done it many times. Um, some banks have their own process. They have an online form that looks different and you're filling it out and, and you never actually see these SBA forms. Behind the scenes, these one of these forms has to be filled out and submitted to the SBA. You may be doing that or your bank may be doing that. But again, you'll need to consult with your bank to understand the application process and see you know, the nuance of, of how what they expect from you. Generally speaking, um, this will give you an idea of what's required of you uh, depending on which form ultimately will be required to be submitted on your behalf. So there are three forms. So there's 3508S. This is the easiest form. This form really doesn't require any information other than demographic information, information about your organization. In fact, let me show you while I've got this up. I'm going to just show you what this looks like. So hopefully everyone can still see my screen. Um, but this is, this is what it asks for. It asks for the business legal name, the address, the EIN, uh, the phone number, email address, primary contact. You'll have to fill in the SBA uh, PPP loan number. You can get that from your bank. You'll need to put in the PPP loan amount. You'll need to specify the number of employees on payroll at the time of the application for the loan. And then at the time of the forgiveness application, um, you'll need to put in the, uh, the covered period. Again, that's at your election. The covered period beginning date is always going to be the date the loan was received but the uh, ending date can be anywhere between eight and 24 weeks after that point. Then you just put in the amount of, of eligible payroll expenses. You'll have to calculate that number um, in your own, uh, on your own. You'll have to calculate that running payroll reports from your payroll provider. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but you don't have to break it out for the SBA. They don't look for any kind of breakout. They just wanna know how much did you spend on payroll? And then you ask, and then you put in how much you're requesting forgiveness for. Then you just have to sign off on a bunch of things and agree to several things. And then the rest is, is instructions down here. So it's a very easy form. It doesn't require any complex calculations. Again, you will internally have to do a, a little bit of calculating um, to make sure that you're putting the correct number up there. But those are just documents you'll retain on your own um, just for record keeping purposes. Form 3508EZ is similar in most respects. I'll show you this one um, with a couple exceptions. So all the beginning information is still required, but instead of just putting one number for total payroll costs, they're gonna ask you to break out your, your payroll costs or mortgage interest or lease, rent or lease payments, utility payments, all of the different costs need to be broken out. And the SBA will review your um, supporting documentation to make sure that you've actually put the correct numbers in here. So with the 3508S, you have to calculate it internally to make sure you're doing it correctly in case you get audited or in case they come back and, and review your work. But you don't have to actually show the SBA any documentation. Um, they'll take your word for it. With the 3508EZ, they will not take your word for it. You will have to send them all of the required documents to prove that you actually spent what you claim you've spent. So that includes payroll documents, copies of bills, copies of payment confirmations, all of that stuff. Um, otherwise, it's a pretty simple application, not difficult. Honestly, it's about, about as easy as the 3508S because either way, you have to make the calculations, you've got to run the reports, you've got to find the documentation and um, save it just for record keeping purposes. Um, and to make sure that your numbers are correct. But with, with the 3508EZ, you have to submit that. With the 3508S, you don't even have to submit it. You just save it in your own files. 
Now I should say, sometimes banks will ask for supporting documentation even on the 3508S, just because the bank wants to be sure that you're doing everything correctly. But the bank is not going to transmit that documentation to the SBA. The bank would only transmit the 3508S. So again, everything I'm saying is sort of subject to change based on your, um, your bank's policy. But this is, as a general rule, what the SBA is actually requiring. The 3508 um, general form, um, just, just, ju just the 3508, is the most difficult form to fill out. This requires all everything that 3508EZ requires. So again, all of the numbers for your eligible costs, all of the supporting documentation have to be attached. And then in addition to that, they require information to, to, to prove that you did not have a reduction in wages and that you did not have a reduction in headcount or hours during the, the period of the loan. So we talked about that a little bit before. Um, if there was a reduction in, in compensation by more than 25% um, between 2019 and 2020, or if there was a reduction in hours or headcount, you will be uh, on the hook for some sort of reduction in your eligible forgiveness amount. Now, depending on how high your payroll costs are or your eligible costs are, you may very well still receive full forgiveness, but you're gonna have to prove to the SBA that your reduction in wages and or hours and FTE were not so much um, to, to cause to, to cause the penalty to, 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 to prohibit you from getting full forgiveness. And this worksheet, this application walks you through the specific calculation of how to determine if you'll get full forgiveness or not based on that reduction. Um, but you have to go through the process of calculating all that out and then sending the supporting documentation to prove how much you reduce wages and how much you reduced headcount um, or full-time equivalents. So this is the worst form to fill out. It's most complicated. Um, it, it, it's a little messy. Ultimately, it's gonna give you the information on whether you are on the hook for a reduction or not. Um, fortunately, many of you will not have to fill out 3508. So let me explain who has to fill out what. So the 3508S, again, that's the super easy one. That one basically just says, we'll take your word for it. You're gonna to have to sign off and confirm that you meet these these qualifications, and you're going to have to do your calculations internally, but we are not going to ask you to prove to us that your calculations are accurate. We just need demographic information, and we need to know the number of eligible payroll costs. Um, the only requirements are you have to have a loan of less than $150,000. If your loan amount was less, what was equal to or less than $150K, um, you're going to theoretically qualify. You also, though, need to to ensure that the requirements for Form 3508EZ are still met. So what do I mean that by that? Well, if you go to the next bullet point, you'll see the requirements for 3508EZ. The, the requirements I've simplified a little bit, but generally speaking, this is what they are. Wages were not reduced by more than 25% during the covered period. So during the period that you're claiming eligible expenses, you cannot have reduced um, uh, your, your employee wages by more than 25%. Now there's an exception. Any employee that was making more than $100,000 uh, annually, uh, if their pay was reduced, that doesn't matter. They, they don't care about that. But anybody that was making under $100,000 annually, if you reduce their pay by more than 25% during that cover period, that's that disqualifies you from filling out 3508EZ or from filling out 3508S. And then between... January 1st of 2020 and the end of the covered period, whenever that might be, there, there cannot have been any reduction in hours or headcount. So there's not a 25% threshold. With the wages, you know, you could reduce wages by 20% and still be safe. Um, but with, with respect to headcount and hours, you cannot reduce them at all. Um, so you need to be able to demonstrate that if you have hourly employees, the average number of hours worked in 2020 did not reduce when compared to 2019. And if you had, you know, let's just say you had 25.2 full-time equivalents or FTE, that's a way to kind of count full-time and part-time employees. If that was the number of full-time equivalents you had in 2019, you cannot have reduced that number in 2020. Um, the only exception to that is if your organization was legally required 
in your municipality or county or state to shut down due to COVID, then you're exempt from that second requirement. So you can reduce headcount and reduce hours and still be safe to file the 3508EZ or the 3508S. So I hope this makes sense. The 3508S, you have to, there cannot have been a reduction in wages of more than 25%. There cannot have been a reduction in headcount or hours at all. And your loan has to be under $150,000. And if so, if you meet those three criteria, you can apply using the, the 3508S form. And the advantage of that form, again, is you don't really have to provide any documentation to prove your numbers. You still have to report accurately. I, I want to be clear, you are on the hook. You, there's a chance, I, I, it's probably unlikely, but there is a chance that you would be audited by the SBA anytime in, over the next six years. And uh, if you are audited, even if you got a loan of less than 150,000, they're still gonna make sure that you put your numbers in correctly. And they're gonna ask for proof that you saved all the documentation and that your, your calculations are correct. Um, but it's more on the honor system. Unless you're audited, they're gonna just take your word for it. You're not gonna have to go through the red tape of proving everything initially. You're just gonna have to do the calculations internally, make sure you're doing it correctly. And assuming you are, you, you're, you're good to go. If you meet the, the first two criteria, the wages um, not being reduced by more than 25% and the head count not being reduced at all in 2020, um, but your loan is above 150,000, you don't get to file the 3508S, but you do get to file the 3508EZ. And like I said earlier, that's almost just as easy as the 3508S. The only difference is, um, you actually have to send all of the documentation to the SBA uh, and you have to split out your calculation in a little bit more detail on the form. You're still going to have to do all that. You'll still have to gather your documentation and, and um, do your calculations if you file the 3508S because you still have to make sure you're doing, uh, you're, you're accurately calculating your forgiveness eligibility, but you don't have to mess with sending that to the SBA unless you're filing the 3508EZ. Um, so again, that's for anybody that did not have those reductions, but still their loan was above $150,000. Okay, and then finally, 3508, the, the regular 3508 form, that's required for any organization that does not fit one of the above two criteria. Um, so that's the form. It has all the same requirements as 3508EZ, but it also requires you to calculate your reduction in um, employees and come up with a percentage, essentially what you're going to do is determine how much did I reduce wages by? How much did I reduce headcount and or hours by? You're going to turn that into a percentage. They're going to call that the reduction quotient or the forgiveness reduction quotient. Let's say that's 80%. That means that all of your pay eligible payroll costs, let's say those eligible payroll costs are $100,000. You multiply those eligible payroll costs by 80%. That's $80,000. That is now your new eligible cost amount. Um, so your eligible costs get lumped together. You multiply them by that reduction quotient. And that now becomes your new eligible cost amount. And your loan forgiveness cannot exceed that re reduced eligible cost number. So your, your forgiveness cannot be $100,000. It can only be $80,000. Now, if your, your loan was only $50,000, you're still going to get full forgiveness. Um, even though you had a reduction quotient of $80,000 due to reduced hours, reduced headcount, or reduced wages, you'll still get full forgiveness because you had eligible costs of 100, you reduced those by 80%, and um, you'll, you ended up with a new eligible cost amount of $80,000, which is still above your loan amount. Now, if your loan was $100,000, um, then now you're not going to get full forgiveness. You may want to go back and just double check that you've accounted for all possible uh, eligible costs. Maybe you, you gathered together your payroll costs and your utilities and your rent, and you only came up with $100,000 eligible costs. And then you multiply that by your reduction quotient of 80%. And now you only have $80,000 of eligible costs. And your loan was $100,000. Well, now you still have $20,000 of loan that will not be forgiven unless you can come up with more eligible costs to add to your calculations. So that's where you may want to go back and say, all right, let me look at my list again. I'll go back a couple slides. 
and say, okay, are there any contractors that I've been paying um, based on contracts that were in effect prior to the loan? Are there any, you know, any PPE or other, you know, facility modifications we had to make due to COVID and start finding those other small things to see what those add up to, to kind of increase your, your loan eligibility as much as possible. Because again, that reduction quotient is going to, going to limit how much you can claim, um, but you can still, if you can come up with enough eligible expenses to get you over that loan amount, even if um, you take that 80% reduction quotient, then you'll be okay. Now, I want to clarify that 80% reduction quotient is just an example. Your reduction quotient could be any number. Um, basically, the number is the percentage, the reduction quotient percentage is lower the more you reduced headcount or wages or hours during that covered period. If you reduce just a little bit, if you just, if there was just one employee that, if you have a team of, you know, let's say you have a team of 100 people and you just let go of one employee, that was just a, a small reduction in headcount. Um, so you're, you're only going to, your reduction quotient will still be very high. It'll probably be somewhere around 99%. Um, the calculation is a little more complex than that. But generally speaking, you take the number of employees you had, um, it, it, you, that's your denominator. You take the, the number that you removed, that's your numerator. So you divide the number of employees you lost by the number you had. And, um, and that's the, the amount you reduced your headcount by. Um, and you know, you, you take one minus that number and that gets you your reduction quotient. I'm I'm oversimplifying dramatically. Don't get hung up on the details here, but that's generally how this calculation works. In other words, if you reduced your headcount by 20%, your reduction quotient is probably going to be somewhere around 80%. Um, it's the inverse of that number. Um, you want your reduction quotient to be as high as possible or to be 100%. If it's 100%, you don't have to fill out 3508 at all. If you didn't have reduction then you just mess with 3508EZ. I know it gets complicated and I don't want to get too far in the weeds because for the vast majority of you, that really won't apply. The mass, vast majority of you did not reduce wages by more than 25% and did not reduce headcount. Um, I guess I should also note, you may have let somebody go, but um, replace them with somebody else. Or you may have, you know, everybody has natural turnover in their organization. That's acceptable. But if you had to let somebody go due to COVID or you removed a position and did not replace that position, that's where you start to run into um, more complicated territory. And you got to make sure um, you're in, in that case, you're going to generally have to apply for, for the loan using 3508 and filling out that reduction quotient calculation. OK, let me just go through a couple more quick things. Um, these are I already kind of touched on this, but these are the types of documents you're going to have to gather when applying for forgiveness. So payroll reports are the biggest one. And usually these are the easiest ones to obtain. Uh, if you're using a payroll provider like Gusto or Paychex or IPS or um, I don't know, you name it, any of these payroll providers, they have custom reports set up um, that allow you to just go into the system and click you know, PPP forgiveness documents. And they'll give you all the reports you need for PPP forgiveness. They've done all the work on, behind the scenes to know what the SBA wants to see and what the SBA doesn't need to see. And they will generate reports that give you exactly what you need in order to calculate your forgiveness and in order to submit your application. So the payroll reports are super easy. Those are the preferred um, documents to have to gather. That's why I said earlier, if you're able to achieve full forgiveness by only accounting for your payroll costs during that co covered period, in other words, if your payroll costs during that covered period exceeded your loan amount and you didn't have any reduction quotient or anything like that, just don't even worry about the other um, eligible costs. Don't even think about them. Just take your payroll, go to your payroll provider, run the reports you need to run, and, and you're good to go. Um, if you have to go in and, um, and claim you know, mortgage interest or utilities or anything like that, um, then you're going to have a little bit more work gathering all that other documentation uh, in order to get you to full forgiveness. Not the end of the world, but you know, if you can, just take those payroll reports. If that's enough, then just run with those. Obviously, if you're um, if you're um, gathering, if, if you're accounting for those other covered costs, um, you're going to have to get copies of bills and copies of payment confirmations from those. Um, I should also say benefits, so healthcare and um, and retirement benefits, we talked about that a little bit, that's all included in your payroll cost number. 
Um, but many of our clients and, and many of you out there may have enough um, payroll costs, meaning just gross wages and taxes, that might alone be enough to get you to full forgiveness. If that's the case, don't even mess with the benefits. Um, you don't even have to track down copies of your United Healthcare statements or your, your retirement statements. You can literally just take the payroll reports directly. Uh, if you have a payroll provider like JustWorks or ADP Total Source, a PEO that manages your benefits, they'll give you a report that shows you all of that together. If you're using a payroll provider like Gusto or IPS or Paychex, um, they don't manage your benefits. So the reports they give you will show you gross wages and state and local taxes. Um, they'll show you the 941s too, but they will not show you your benefits expenses. You'll have to find that information from your benefits providers. Um, but again, in many cases, you may not even have to mess with that. You may not have to track down those benefit um, expenses um, because your payroll reports alone get you to the number you need to get to. So, you know, I guess my point is, start with the easiest documentation that there is to gather. And once you get to a place where you have demonstrated that you have enough costs to receive full forgiveness, then you can stop gathering documentation. Um, and if you go back and you realize, okay, I haven't quite gotten to full forgiveness, then you can go back and start finding some of the other eligible costs that may have been incurred, but that the documentation may be harder to find. The other thing I wanna clarify, and I've got this on italics at the bottom here, the SBA has stated that the statute of limitations on these loans is six years. So that's six years starting at the date that you receive forgiveness. Um, the SBA can come knocking on your door and audit all of your numbers if you want to. That doesn't matter, doesn't matter what form you filled out. You could fill out 3508S, even though they took your word for it um, when you applied for the loan. If, if they come knocking on your door, they randomly decide to audit you um, and they, they say, hey, you claim that you had $100,000 in payroll costs, prove it. Um, you'll have to have all that documentation ready to show them that your numbers tie out and that you did your math correctly. Um, furthermore, if, if you, you know, in order to file 3508S, you have to claim that there was no reduction in headcount or, or salaries. If there was, then you're, again, you're going to run into problems. Um, you've got to be able to prove all the assertions that you made in that application were actually true. Again, my prediction is that it's probably very unlikely that, that you would get audited, um, but it's a possibility. It can happen, and they have every right to go in and audit you up to that six-year period. So make sure you have your ducks in a row. Make sure you've saved your documents in an easy-to-find location. Okay, I presented for a little longer than I intended to, um, but I hope you found this useful. I know we went through a lot of information uh, in a short period of time, but uh, I will take questions at this point. Anybody that has questions, like I said earlier, questions about the content of this presentation, I'll prioritize. But if you have questions about any topic, feel free to, to throw them out here and I'll, I'll do my best to address them. Just as um, I think it, I think in Zoom, you can raise your hand um, to vote, just kind of with a show of hands, if you just hit that raise hand button, how many of you have received a PPP loan? Okay, I see a few of you in here. How many of you have, have or have not received forgiveness? So let's, let's say how many of you have actually received forgiveness or applied for forgiveness, I should say, on your loan? So it looks like a lot of you that have received the loan have also applied for forgiveness. So that's, that's great news. Um, yeah, and if you work with a provider like us, you know, not to not to tutor our own horn, but we we make it pretty easy for you. <laughs> um, you know, we'll we'll go in and we'll gather the documentation that's needed, and we'll help you make that process uh, as easy as possible. We'll answer your questions. We'll help you know interface with the bank to the extent that the bank will let us um, to make sure that the process goes super smoothly. Okay, well, I'll give it a few more seconds, but if there are no other questions, um, we, can, uh, we can get out of here early. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Um, I hope that uh, everybody enjoys the weather. My understanding is it's supposed to be great weather coming up this weekend, so at least in St. Louis, where I'm at. I don't know about everybody else, but um, all right. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, hope you got something out of this. If you have questions or if you um, you know, are interested in learning more about the services we provide, feel free to reach out. Um, 
you can contact us. We have all of our contact information is is public. Um, you can get go to our website, thecharitycfo.com. You can go to our Facebook page. Um, you can um, follow us on social media. I encourage you to do so. All right, everyone, have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you again in a couple of weeks.